Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to visit uh, Chile, and I thank uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me here. It's been very exciting to come here. I should explain why I'm going to be talking to you about the brain. It's a philosophy conference, so why would I be talking about the brain? Well, I think that the kinds of advances that are being made these days in understanding how the brain works are quite fundamental to establishing the central, a good answer to the central philosophical problem about the relation between mind and body. So the mind-body problem has been an important one in philosophy since the ancient Greeks. And I think it's important, in fact, goes broader than that. Because if you have a solution to the mind-body problem, and I'm going to be recommending that these new ideas about the brain provide that solution, then you actually have a big step forward in a lot of other central philosophical problems. Metaphysics, for example, the battles between dualism and idealism and materialism revolve around questions about the relation between mind and brain, mind and body. So if you have a solution there, then a lot of metaphysical problems fall into place. Similarly, a lot of epistemological questions about the nature of knowledge take on a different cast when you have a way of thinking about how the mind works and how it actually acquires knowledge. Even more normative questions in philosophy of the sort that you find in ethics and in aesthetics also take on a different complexion if you have a good account of the relation between mind and body. So I think the mind and body problem is not just on the side of philosophy, it's absolutely central to it. And I'm going to propose today a solution to the mind-body problem based on current ideas, very current, very new ideas about how uh, the brain works. So I'm going to be concentrating on two of the most difficult aspects of the mind to understand, emotions and consciousness. These are often thought to be the kinds of, ma of material, the kinds of issues that support dualism. Consciousness in particular is thought by many people not to be open to a materialistic explanation. Uh, but I think it can be. But it's also tied in with questions of emotions, because our emotions are an important part of the consciousness that we have all the time. You feel happy or you feel sad. So I'm going to start off talking about emotions and why they aren't just a side issue to understanding the mind. They're actually quite central to understanding the mind. And I'll give a description of the main current theories in philosophy and psychology about emotions. And I'm going to propose a new one that you won't have seen before that I think provides a really good explanation of all the different aspects of emotions, including consciousness. It's based on an idea that's really new called semantic pointers. This is a new theory of mind, only been around for the last few years, but it seems to me to solve really crucial psychological and philosophical problems about how the mind works based on brain operations. Then I'll apply it to emotions and then also to uh, consciousness if I have time, but I think maybe I, at, I, at this point I'd be risking keeping you away from cocktails, so it might be better if I, if I leave that for the questions forward. So what is emotion? Well, you might think when I asked that question, I'd start with a definition. In analytic philosophy, it's been typical to give a conceptual analysis by trying to give a definition. The only problem with these kinds of conceptual analyses is they never work. Because whenever when people propose a definition, immediately people start to give counterexamples to it. Well, I think you can have a good understanding of why these kinds of definitions never work if you have a better theory of concepts, one that is more consistent with what we know from psychology about how people use concepts. The theory I have in mind is published just a couple of days ago in the journal Cognitive Science by uh, my co-authors and I. It's a paper called Concepts or Somatic Pointers. It's already available on the website, so if you just Google that, you'll be able to get a copy of it. And we argue that the different kinds of evidence that people have found against the traditional view of concepts as definitions can in fact be explained by using this new idea I'll be telling you about with relation to emotions, namely the idea of semantic pointers. So that's to come still, but I'm not going to talk more about concepts now. I'm just going to, in fact, give an account of what emotions are based on a sort of conceptual analysis that falls out of that theory. I call it three analysis, because instead of giving an analysis of a concept in terms of definitions, what you do is you'd find three different characteristics. First of all, you give exemplars, which are standard examples. 
Second, you give typical features, which don't have to be universal, necessary, and sufficient conditions. They only have to be typical. And third, you describe the explanatory role of concepts. So let me give you a three analysis of, of emotions. So exemplars are easy, the standard examples. You're all familiar with emotions like happiness, sadness, fear, anger, disgust, surprise, guilt, pride, gratitude, envy. There are dozens or possibly hundreds of other, other emotions, and we're all familiar with this from our own experience. So this gives us an idea of what an emotion is, independent of being able to give a definition of it. But that's not all we can do. We can also look at what are typical features. It may not hold of every emotions, but nevertheless generally hold. One characteristic is that they're positive and negative. All of you know that happiness feels good and sadness and fear feel bad. So this is positive and negative characteristic. Another key aspect is uh, intensity. You can have very mild happiness, being a bit content, feeling okay. On the other hand, you can have excitement and exuberance and elation. Those are very extreme versions of happiness. So intensity is also an aspect of emotions that's typical. Conscious experience, uh, taking consciousness very seriously. I think you can't talk about emotions without talking about the feelings that we have, but that doesn't seem to me to be a bar to a materialist account if we can give a materialist, brain-based account of conscious experience, which is what I'm going to try to do. Uh, and then uh, also, another typical feature of emotions, it's not universal, but typically emotions lead to action. So that uh, when I have decisions to make, they're very much tied to emotions. When I got an invitation uh, to come to Chile, I thought, oh, Chile, wow! That was my emotional, emotional, emotional reaction, and so that led to action, namely saying yes and, and coming here. Um, okay, so, but that's not all. There's psychological experiments that suggest that another part of concepts is they play an explanatory role. They're not just descriptive. They explain why things are happening. So what's the explanatory role of emotions? Well, it's very big, because if you ask Someone, why are you feeling that way? Why are you happy today? Well, they'll say, I have an emotion. It's an emotion that provides the explanation. People's reports. People will say, I feel happy or I feel sad. Uh, but they also behave in ways that indicate that they're happy or sad. Their facial expressions or their body actions are different. So these are the sorts of things that go into it. Another crucial part of the explanatory role that's part of concepts is what explains them? Where do they come from? Well, here we have a big puzzle. Because what is the explanation of emotions? Why do people have emotions? Well, before we get to that, let me say why anyone who's interested in the mind at all should be concerned about emotions. This hasn't been the common view in philosophy. Going back to Plato, the view is that humans are essentially rational animals or rational beings, and what matters is our rationality. And the emotions just get in the way. Uh, Plato actually had a metaphor where he said we should think of ourselves as uh, a horseman with a chariot, and we've got horses, and the, one of the horses is emotion, and we have to keep it in line. Uh, and so you often see people, are you being rational or being emotional? Well, actually, I think that's a big mistake. There's loads of psychological and, and now, in fact, neural evidence that that's not how emotions work. Emotions are a major part of our mental life, of our relationships, of people we care about, uh, romantic partners, uh, children, parents, of our work. Uh, the way I decide what to work on is always really a matter of emotion. What's exciting? What's not boring? And so it's very much a matter of making my work reflect what I find interesting and exciting. Uh, the arts, so aesthetics, are really crucial really involved with the emotions. If you see, if you read a beautiful poem or see a fabulous play or a beautiful painting or listen to a song, it's going to be engaging you emotionally or it's not an important uh, piece of work. Um, so those are the kinds of things that go into um, emotions as a major part of mental life. Okay. So it's better if I use this one? Okay, that's fine, great. Um, okay. Uh, I already mentioned that motivate, emotions motivate actions. For example, when we love somebody, we want to be with them, we want to approach them. If there's somebody we hate, on the other hand, we want to avoid them. Mental illnesses, when minds stop working, all have emotional aspects to it, not just more common ones like depression and anxiety, but also major kinds of psychosis, like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. 
Finally, there are reasons to think of emotions as not just what gets in our way, but as biologically valuable. They do evaluations. It's emotions that are telling us whether things are going good or bad, whether we should continue or stop. We also have uh, attention, what we focus on, what we shift around to different things. It's very much determined by our emotions. Motivation, why we want to do some things other than others. And of course, social connections, the sort of relationships that we want to have. Okay, so what are emotions? Here are the pre predominant theories of emotion. The theory of emotion that's held by the vast majority of people in the world, because most people in the world today are religious, about 5 billion or 7 billion, people think they're going to keep having emotions after they die. And for this to be true, then emotion has to be a property of non-material souls. It has to be something spiritual. Uh, well, I don't think there's much evidence for that, so I'm going to be presenting a more naturalistic alternative. You know, among naturalistic theories, scientific theories of emotion, there's a number that are already around. The oldest one that goes back at least to Aristotle is that emotion is a kind of judgment. It's an appraisal where you're thinking about what's the relevance of something to your goals. Um, so why am I happy that I'm in Chile? Well, because it's been interesting people, interesting scenery, interesting food and wine. So these are all things that I like. And so I can make the judgment that being in Chile is appropriate for my goals. But there's another aspect of emotion that's been known for a long time, which is that it involves physiology, it involves the body. William James was the first one to propose that emotions, the judgment comes second, what comes first is in fact people's, uh, people's changes in their bodies. And this has become a very popular theory of emotion, so what's happening in your body? If something really makes you happy, then you are going to have a heart, faster heartbeat. You're going to be uh, having different changes in your cortisol levels. You're going to be smiling, so your face is changing, your body language will be different. Whereas if you're sad, you may be different body language, different facial expression, different kinds of physiology. So that's been taken as an alternative theory. I don't think it's an alternative theory. I think these are just parts of the theory of emotion. Another theory of emotion that's been popular among some philosophers and psychologists is that emotion is primarily a kind of social linguistic construction. It's something that's part of our language. The fifth theory of emotions that you won't have heard of before because it's brand new is a theory that emotion is a kind of brain process based on semantic pointers. And I will explain this strange idea of semantic pointers very shortly. Um, so the idea here is that when you have an emotion, your brain is able to bind together a bunch of things. It's able to bind together a concept or a belief, these are mental structures, with the cognitive appraisal, which is the judgment that you're making about how that concept of belief fits with your goals, but also a judgment about what's happening, or an, a, a, a binding with what's happening in your body, what's happening in your physiology. So, uh, being in uh, Paris, it would be a matter of having a representation of Paris, and I think of the buildings, or the appraisals, or the uh, physiology. All of these things are going to be part of being happy to be in Paris. Okay. So, the claim here, and now this is becoming philosophically quite radical, is that all of these things, concepts, beliefs, the judgment that you're making about the emotion, and the perception of physiology, are all patterns of firing in the neurons. These are all brain activities. Now, that's a view that it probably goes back to the ancient Greeks. Hippocrates was probably the first Greek philosopher to suggest that what goes on in the mind goes on in the brain. But now I think the evidence is starting to accumulate that this is actually true. And the way that the binding works, the binding is a crucial operation to tie these things together, to tie together the concept or belief that your emotion is about, the judgment that you're making about it, and the appraisal, these are all going to be done using a whole system of mind called the somatic pointer architecture. So how does this work? Well, I honestly think <clears throat> that this is the best theory of mind that's come along yet. And I'm very happy that it was developed by a colleague of mine at the University of Waterloo, Chris Eliasson. That's a picture that came up in the corner. And it's really new. 
The first publication of the semantic pointer idea was only 2012 uh, in the journal Science. This is the world's leading science magazine, so that's a pretty good place to start. What he reported, what he and his co-workers reported, was the largest neural network, artificial neural network computer simulation ever. And they're able to model two and a half million artificial neurons. And they're able to show that using this new idea of mind, they're able to handle quite a wide variety of mental processes. And so their computer simulations are able to do things like recognize numbers, tell the difference between a three and a six, for example. It's also able to do some complex inferences about those representations. It's also able to control a robotic arm. And so it's able to act in the world. Uh, uh, the best source of this idea, though, is Chris's big book, How to Build a Brain, which I think is the best book in philosophy and psychology of mind in the last couple of decades. So it's an incredibly rich view of, of how the mind works based on this new ideas. But let me put it in a broader uh, context. So people have been trying for a long time in cognitive science, going back to the 50s, to understand how the mind works. Um, the approach that became popular in the 1950s, and is still popular today, is the idea that intelligence results from the processing of physical symbols. Now this view is very natural for, law, for philosophers. If your background's in logic or a language, you can think of symbols as things that we can process. And this idea got absorbed into traditional artificial intelligence through the work of Herbert Simon and other people. Um, so that's a natural, almost commonsensical way of thinking about where our intelligence comes from. It comes from our ability to process symbols. But in the 1980s, an alternative way of thinking about the mind and the brain came about uh, called connectionism or parallel distributed processing, or PDP, uh, that says, that, no, that's wrong. Our intelligence isn't the result of our ability to manipulate symbols. It's mostly the result of the way in which we can use brain structures that are much smaller than symbols. That are, that are some symbolic. They're neural representations operating with representations that are distributed. So the idea of distributed representation is really new. Instead of thinking a representation as something like a word, we think of a representation as something that can be operating in millions or billions of neurons. And so your concept of chicken, for example, is distributed across these millions of neurons. And this has been a very popular uh, way of thinking about how the mind works in cognitive science since the 80s. And re most recently, it's become enormously influential in artificial intelligence as well. The, for a long time, people in artificial intelligence looked down their noses had ideas about parallel distributed processing or these kinds of subset all the processes. But the most recent major advances in artificial intelligence have come through the work of what's called deep learning. Now, deep learning is a development of these ideas, and it's being used now by Apple and by Facebook and by Google in all of their most successful techniques for recognizing faces and for doing voice recognition. So if you use your iPhone or your Android phone and you use voice recognition, that's using deep learning, which is all based on these ideas from the 80s. So we seem to have a division here. Are we really symbol processes or something symbolic? Well, I never thought that these were alternatives. I thought there ought to be a way of putting it together that I didn't know how to do it. But Chris really figured out how to do it. He figured out a way of thinking of how our brain, uh, millions or billions of neurons processing things together, can in fact have, do symbolic processes as well to do the sorts of things that logic makes familiar, logical reasoning as well. And the key to it is this idea of semantic pointers. Okay, so let me start to tell you how it works. Well, to understand semantic pointers, there are two key issues you need. One is representation and one is binding. Now for most of you, a representation is going to be something like a word or a picture. And there's a picture that shows the exit. So that's a representation, it's a thing. <clears throat> but what you get from neural networks is a different way of thinking of a representation, not as a thing, but as a process. It's something that's done not by one neuron, it's done by millions of neurons working together. So this idea of representation has actually been around since Donald Hebb, the Canadian psychologist, talked about it back in the 1940s. But it's new still to most people in uh, philosophy and psychology. The idea is a representation isn't a thing, it's a pattern of firing in a population of neurons. 
Okay, but that just gives us very simple representations. How do we get more complicated representations? How do we go from uh, chicken to chicken sandwich? We have to be able to put together a representation of chicken and sandwich. Well, that requires another neural process called binding. Binding is what takes place when you've got different representations and then you put them together into something more complicated. Easy to do in language, because we can make complicated sentences like, chicken sandwich tastes good. Well, that's all binding. But how does the brain do it? Well, there are two theories of binding currently in neuroscience. One is that binding takes place because you can get a kind of coordination, temporal coordination of the different neurons. So you could have a whole bunch of neurons for chicken and a bunch of neurons for sandwich. And what happens when you put them together is you get those two groups of neurons firing together. But there's limitations to that. Chris Elias Smith has been working with a different theory of binding called convolution. It's a way in which neural populations can actually become twisted together, they can be convolved. Now, I don't have time to explain to you the mathematics for that, it's quite tricky. So let me just give you a simple metaphor. You can think of these neural populations not as just becoming synchronized, but actually becoming braided together. They get combined or woven together into a new representation. And what Chris Elias Smith was able to show is that neural populations can do this kind of braiding, can do this kind of convolution. So you can get the capacity of our brains with these very simple neurons to make representations, but then make more and more complicated representations by binding using this convolution operator. So this is what really can make for full level intelligence as well as complex emotions, because you can get not just bindings, but also bindings of bindings of bindings that can be recursive. Okay, so here's the idea of semantic pointers that combines these sorts of things. So uh, Chris's the idea is we want to be able to show how we can get meaning out of neural processes, out of physical processes. And there's two kinds of meaning that operate thanks to the semantic pointers. One Chris calls uh, shallow, uh, which gets you symbol-like relations to the world and to other representations. So this is the relation of, say, chicken to uh, leg, the different kinds of words that can be associated with each other. But a deeper meaning that ties it closer to the world, to our perceptual processes, comes from being able to take these semantic pointers and relate them to our perceptions, to what we see and smell and hear and taste, but also to our motor operations. I don't think I've ever done anything. Oh, I, I picked up a dead chicken. So you pick up a dead chicken. Maybe if you have a live chicken, you grab it by the neck or something like that. Uh, but also could be partly emotional information, whether you like chicken or whether you dislike chickens. These are all three parts. And it also turns out that you not only get the semantics with semantic pointers, they're capable of complex syntactic operations. You can show how neural processes operating in the brain can do complicated inferences. So if it's a chicken, then I'm going to like it. You can do different kinds of reasoning with semantic pointers. But you also, because you've got the aspect of emotions tied in, you can also get the practical part, the pragmatic part. So usually in logic and in computers and in linguistics, the way it operates by doing syntax first, and then you try to build semantics on top of that, and then you try maybe get around to practical matters like goals and context, get to pragmatic, pragmatics later on. But that's not how the brain works. The brain can do syntax, semantics, and pragmatics all at once, all integrated with each other. How does it do that? Well, I think semantic pointers is the first plausible explanation of how it can have these kinds of amazing capacities. Okay, so what does it look like? When Chris explains semantic pointers, he usually does it in mathematics, uh, but I'm just gonna show you some pictures. So think of what's going on in this picture as a bunch of uh, neurons. So here, for sensory experience, this could be what you're seeing or hearing or smelling. This here it looks like six neurons. Think of it as 6,000 or 6 million neurons. So you've got sensory processes generating representations in thousands of neurons. But you've also got representations that are connected with what you do with your body. These are the motor neurons. Uh, again, 6,000 or 6 million of them. Uh, also emotions. 
emotions, what we'll get to soon, are binding things together in different ways. And also, if you're a human being, as opposed to other animals, we've got language as well. So you can have the verbal representation, such as the word chicken. What goes into the semantic pointer, by means of binding, is you can combine all these different kinds of representations into together, into something that's more, uh, more complete, and that's what the semantic pointer is. It's the result of taking a bunch of neural representations and then combining it into something that's more complicated. But the great thing about semantic pointers is you not only make them, you can do things with them. And you can do things with them that are symbolic, but also things that are capable of getting back the sensory motor <clears throat> information that went into them. So the semantic pointers can be used for making inferences, connecting up with other symbols, but they can also retain the connection to our sense experience because they can be unpacked or decompressed. You can think of them as like a, a music file that uh, has been very much compressed, but then you can play it on your speakers in order to get back the material. And so you can unpack them to get the whole thing. So you haven't lost the crucial sensory motor and emotional information that you're making. Here's another crucial process, a crucial mechanism that's important for working with semantic pointers. And this one turns out to be really important for consciousness. Because in order to figure out what we're conscious of, we need a notion of competition. There's lots of different things <clears throat> going on in our minds all the time. But in order to have consciousness of some things rather than others, we need a kind of competition. And the competition is performed by a, a matter of recurrent connections. So there's different semantic pointers are the result of binding a lot of different information. Uh, and so in order to be able to figure out what is worth being conscious of, you need to have a kind of competition. And we figured out in a paper on consciousness to how to do that kind of competition. Okay, so now what are emotions? Well, emotions are semantic pointers. That's the hypothesis that says that this is just the kind of neural structure you need to understand emotions. So it's going to have a representation of the situation. Um, so I'm happy to be in Santiago. I need a representation of Santiago. Different parts of the city, the hills, and the river, and so on. Uh, I need physiological changes. So the physiological changes are heartbeat, breathing rate, cortisol levels, and so on. Uh, I need appraisal. I need the judgment that goes into figuring out how is being in Santiago uh, satisfying my goals and satisfying lots of my goals for social interactions and for being in a nice place. And also, in the case of humans, a representation of self. And so it's me who's having the emotion, and of course I've got a rich representation of myself. So the idea here is we don't have to suppose that these are competing theories of emotion because the brain is able to take these different kinds of aspects and combine them all together up into one somatic pointer that's going to be the pattern of neural firing that explains happiness or sadness or other emotions. Let me give you a specific example. Um, so sadness. I suppose you're sad about something. I've got a good friend whose cat is really sick. And so she's sad that her cat is sick. What goes into that? Well. It's a representation of the situation. Um, she's attached to her cat, and it makes her feel, well, so that's, that's the representation of the cat, and the, and the cat is ill. Um, there's an appraisal. Um, so after the cat dies, then the, the relationship will be over with the cat. Uh, physiological, the physiology of sadness is well known. It goes with low heart rate, uh, slower breathing rate, higher cortisol levels different facial expressions when you have a frown, and so on. Uh, but also, uh, sadness tends to go with different kinds of motor things. But if you're sad about something, you're more likely to withdraw from the world in general. So these are all aspects of emotion that can be captured by neural representations. But the actual emotion of sadness is a result of binding these all together to do something new. OK, I missed that one. So what to do about emotional uh, phenomena to explain? To have a good theory of emotion, you have to do a bunch of things, most of which I don't have time to do today. 
One is to say, how are emotions formed? Well, I've already told you one hypothesis about how emotions are formed. They're formed because we've got all these different kinds of input from our bodies, from our appraisals, from our other representations and situations in ourself, bind them all together into a semantic pointer, and that's where emotions come from. I haven't told you how emotions influence actions uh, and why emotions are usually conscious. I think I should get to that one. How do emotions get distorted in mental illnesses? Well, that I don't have time to talk about at all, but that's also something I have a good explanation of. And the really key philosophical questions of how emotions can be both rational and irrational. I'll give you the one sentence version of this. Emotions can be sometimes really quite rational if they're based on good appraisals. Um, you can take something like love. Is it rational to be in love with someone? Well, it depends on the situation. If that person is mean to you, then it is irrational for you to be in love with them. On the other hand, if you've made a good appraisal and you make a judgment that that person is meeting your goals because uh, he or she is treating you well and also in love with you, then I think that being in love can be among the most rational things you can ever do in your life. Um, so that's roughly how. This is a view with seeing that emotions can be rational, even though sometimes they are irrational. Okay, so that's how you get actions. Let's move on. Okay, so now let's get to the idea of consciousness. Because I don't think any theory of emotion is any good if it can't explain conscious experience. Because it's a crucial part of being happy or sad that you are feeling it. And of course, there are lots of philosophers who think that the feeling aspect of consciousness is something that's completely beyond the realm of scientific explanation. But I think this theory shows that there's a good candidate for showing them to be wrong. So how does it go? Well, what we need is an account of consciousness that is consistent with the theory of emotion I just gave you. It has to be then a semantic point of theory of consciousness. Well, fortunately, this has already been published. This was published two years ago in a paper that Terry Stewart and I wrote called Two Theories of Consciousness. So if you just Google that, you'll get it on my website and you can have a look at it. Not surprisingly, it's a semantic pointer theory that, of course, fits very well with the emotions. So how does that work? Well, first of all, you need to justify the claim that our mental experiences, or at least the things that we're conscious about, are in fact represented in the brain. But that can be done in a whole series of, of different papers. So the basic claim is that all of these things are, by, are patterns derived from perception, motor control, and verbal representations. So that's going to be a representation of what it is that we're conscious about. But the crucial idea is that consciousness occurs because of competition among these different semantic pointers. And so right now, I hope you're consciously aware of me, but it's late in the day and there's been a lot of talk, so Maybe you're thinking about the football game on Saturday, or maybe you're thinking about the glass of wine that we're supposed to be rewarded about. So that's heavy competition. <clears throat> so what you're actually what you're actually conscious of is going to depend on what's winning that competition, where a competition is now hypothetically to be viewed as between the different semantic pointers. The semantic pointers that win are the ones that produce conscious experience. So if the moment I'm winning the competition, what I'm saying about philosophy and emotions is winning, that's what you're going to be conscious of. But if for various reasons, wine or football or the other things you plan to do this weekend are out competing me, then that's what you're conscious of. So is this theory of consciousness any good? Well, if you look at the two theories of consciousness paper, you'll see that we're able to explain quite a lot of the most interesting aspects of consciousness. We're able to explain uh, why people have different kinds of conscious experiences and why there are conscious experiences are different from each other, uh, why happiness is different from sadness, for example. It's because they're different semantic pointers. They involve different kinds of neural representations and different kinds of bindings. We can explain why consciousness stops and starts. Uh, all of you, I hope, will lose consciousness tonight when you go to sleep and you'll regain it in the morning when you wake up. Uh, we can explain shifts in consciousness of how you can go from thinking about me to thinking about football or wine or your cat, depending on what wins the competition. The unity of consciousness. Now, consciousness is not perfectly unified, but there are lots of ways in which we do manage to combine conscious experience into something that makes sense. Well, unification 
of unity of consciousness, the big problem since Kant, is explained by the binding process that I talked about before. The way that consciousness has different levels. I think that consciousness has a kind of elementary form in all mammals, quite likely in birds, possibly even in fish, I don't know, but certainly in mammals, but it's very rudimentary. It's only in humans that you get a fully developed sense of self. Why is it that we have this higher level of consciousness that you don't find in other animals? Well, it's a degree, it's a matter of having more neurons, which enables us to do more bindings, and so we can bind together a richer representation of self and a binding with everything that's going on. So we can explain why it is that humans seem to have more conscious, more complicated kinds of consciousness than you find in other animals. Uh, and also, uh, consciousness influences actions as well. Uh, so these are all things that are talked about in detail in the various papers that I alluded to. Uh, emotional consciousness then is uh, again going to be a matter of out competing other somatic pointers. So if something's making you happy, something else is making you sad, that's a competition. The winner is going to be the emotion that you actually experience, the happiness rather than the sad. The emotional intensity is really important to competition. I think a big part of what brings things to consciousness in general is, in fact, emotion. It's not the only thing, because there can be other salient aspects of different kinds of representations. But emotions is a big part of determining what, in fact, does bring the competition in one direction rather than another. Uh, and action. Action results from this very naturally because when you've got a complex brain decision taking place, it uses a bunch of different brain areas to figure out what action you should do, whether you should stand up or sit down. These are things that are affected by, again, the competition among somatic pointers. So here, I've been using these ideas very metaphorically, competition, uh, semantic pointers, but these are all ideas that can be worked out in great mathematical detail so that they can be run in computer programs and you can actually see that a computer program can behave in some of the ways that involve forming a representation and performing the competition. So don't be misled by my very metaphorical loose presentation here. This can all be expressed in a way that shows that these are, in fact, mechanisms for operating with emotions and consciousness. Okay, I'm going to skip talk of the hard problem of consciousness because I'm told that we do need to get to the uh, to the to the refreshments. I'll be happy to come back to that in the questions if you like. So let me solve, sum it all up. I've given you a very quick guide to how it is that we can think of emotions and consciousness in really a way that supports a solution to the mind-body problem, and it's a materialist solution. It says that we can understand mind in terms of brain processes. That means we need to be able to explain all mental processes in terms of brain processes, but I actually think that the semantic pointer hypothesis allows us to do that. The book that, I'm, uh, that I just finished a draft of is called Mind Brain, and it shows how semantic pointers can be applied systematically to perception, to imagery, to creativity, to language, not just emotions and consciousness what I've talked about today. But I think it really is a basis for saying that we do have now good reason, not for saying just vaguely that the mind is, for bra is the brain, but rather for saying that the mind is the brain working with these particular kinds of mechanisms, specifying that identity. And what are the mechanisms? Well, they're neural representation, finding semantic pointers, and competition. Once you do that, you can see ways in which semantic pointers integrate in other theories of emotion that have been around. It doesn't integrate the dualist theory, but it's an alternative to it. But it, it provides a way of thinking how appraisal theories of emotion can go together with physiological theories of emotion and even social construction theories of emotion because language can play a big part in the appraisal process and the more worked out theory that we've developed. Finally, the general conclusion I want to draw from this, and I'm sure you're going to have lots of objections, is that now, for the first time, by working out the details of a plausible mechanism for emotions and consciousness, that based on ideas about neural representation and blinding, for the first time, we have a good basis for making the very strong identity claim that emotions and consciousness are brain processes. Thank you.